Hello, good morning, everyone. It is Thursday, August 27th, 2020, the year that is awkward. Uh, we're here with Abby from uh, Radical, uh, who's gonna tell us a little bit more about herself, uh, P2P code collaboration with Radical, and uh, an ongoing topic for us here of open source sustainability. So over to you, Abby, welcome. Great, thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to talk to you all about what we're building with Radical. I think I should share my screen um, and I can get this Figma presentation that I have going, um, which means that I just have to. I think I've made you a co-host, which should allow you to do sharing. Great. Oh, great. I can see my screens. That was perfect. That's exactly what I needed. Cool. Um, so yeah, I will share my screen. Um, can everybody see this black screen? Perfect. So yeah, I think that how this will go, I'll just run through this quick presentation. Um, well, by quick, I mean like maybe 20, 25 minutes uh, and kind of run through generally what Radical is. Um, and it has a nice story. I usually do this at conferences. Of course, we can't go to conferences anymore. So uh, we'll see how this goes. Um, and then we can just have a general chat, open discussion about what we're building at Radical. Cool. Um, so this is a presentation that I did at ECC um, uh, pre-corona, well, you know, pre-really uh, intense corona and back in February in Paris. Um, and uh, it's all about, you know, moving towards peer-to-peer -to -peer alternatives to code collaboration, um, which is what we're doing at Radical. So before I get started, um, talking about Radical, I'll first talk about myself a little bit. Uh, my name is Abby. Uh, I'm a products, community, person, all things. Uh, I really like talking to people and that's what I do at Monatic, um, which is one of the uh, companies funding the development of uh, the Radical project. Um, so at Radical, I'm working all things community development um, and helping our product team build the best product possible for uh, developers around the world. Um, and I do presentations like these for the Radical team. Um, so before I get into Radical and what Radical is. I just want to have a quick story time, which I'm sure is a story that uh, every, a lot of people here know, um, but it's kind of talking about, you know, the start of code collaboration. Uh, and before code collaboration, there was really code, right? Um, so what I like doing when I'm talking about Radical is talk about version control first. Um, so the general history of version control, um, which was that these were software tools that were giving devs the ability uh, to manage changes to their source code over time. And uh, when I was starting to really dive into the free and open source space years ago, I always thought it was really interesting that, um, you know, the shift to distributed version control um, and how originally version control systems like the source code control system uh, slowly evolved to one more open source solutions like um, Subversion. Um, but they were also moving from local to, you know, client server solutions where everything was centralized. And then we kind of had this rise of the distributed version control, um, which really, you know, you realize that in 2005, devs just realized that they didn't need to have this like official source. Um, and every client could instead like hold a complete copy of, um, you know, their entire, entire source code and then like operate it on it locally produce changes and then exchange to use changes directly with other developers. Um, and so this was kind of, you know, the rise of distributed uh, version control. And so uh, Linus back developing Linux kernel, uh, you know, was developing kernel on this uh, distributed version control called BitKeeper, which was closed source. And so, um, you know, uh, a Linux kernel dev being the free software evangelist advocates, vigilantes that they are, decided that they wanted to reverse engineer BitKeeper's networking protocols. Um, and so when they did, BitKeeper actually revoked Linus's free license, um, uh, which led him not being able to use uh, BitKeeper um, and because it was closed source, they didn't want to pay for it. And so thus Git was born, right? Um, and so this, this Git was basically this distributed version control system that was built uh, you know, for um, the Linux kernel community. Um, but was also this like huge innovation in how a, a protocol that could support um, distributed uh, code collaboration. Um, and so, of course, then we saw the rise of many other distributed version control systems like Mercurial and Darks, um, uh, GNU Bazaar. Um, and with the rise, you kind of realized that distributed version control and these protocols that were enabling it uh, were basically like one of the 
largest advancements in um, software development technology over the last decade or so. Um, and so the reason that I tell that story is because it's so important to what code collaboration is now. Um, so if we look at code collaboration back then, we had mailing lists, right? So how Linux kernel uh, was developed. Uh, these were self-hosted mailing lists that were done primarily over email uh, and were pretty hard to manage. I mean, you really had to, this is a picture of one of them. Um, uh, and so, you know, these mailing lists were great for working off of Git um, and you know, be kind of became the way that these open source communities were functioning. But soon enough, you started seeing the rise of hosted platforms where people saw this major issue of having to self host source code and have all of these um, workarounds for being able to share chain sets in an easy way. Um, and basically when GitHub was founded, it was basically saying like, why can't we host the source code? Um, and so of course we all know and love GitHub, GitLab, SourceHut, SourceForge. Um, uh, but, um, you know, there's, I mean, I guess, sorry, I got distracted by a notification on my phone, which I just turned off. <laughs> um, so these hosted platforms kind of now have created this new paradigm of like how people actually collaborate, right? Um, so they're essentially hosted. Um, so all source code is hosted on central servers. They follow usually this like software as a service model. Um, you kind of have this online identity um, because you're also creating an identity on these platforms um, and having a platform to even collaborate on. Um, so the platform acts as this global networking layer that anyone can access. Um, but they're kind of also walled gardens, right? Because they're built on these very open distributed version control protocols, um, but they build unique and often closed source uh, user interfaces and experiences. Um, and so GitHub host platforms, but you know, re also really GitHub have completely changed the game for code collaboration, right? I mean, like if you look at the numbers for how many developers are using GitHub now, like it's, it's unbelievable. It's millions and millions and millions of people are using GitHub and it's because of how great of a platform it is, right? Like GitHub is so easy to use. I mean, look at the interface for email and now look at the GitHub interface. So they created these like extremely rich user interfaces, um, which made it way less intimidating to use Git, which is also like a very kind of intimidating protocol to begin with. Um, and they taught people how to use Git, which is also really important. Uh, what I think is the most impactful, um, uh, you know, game changing thing that GitHub did was really create an accessible and standardized way of working, of collaborating on software. It's like once you know how to collaborate to a project on GitHub, you can contribute to any um, because it created these like very standardized workflows um, that are also native to GitHub, like um, how people have, uh, I mean, native to the interface, right? Like GitHub specific version of issues and PRs and stuff. Um, but they, they made it easy to uh, collaborate and kind of abstracted away from the stuff that was so complicated about Git and created a new platform and a user experience around those workflows um, that are actually what people are doing when they're connecting to each other. And they made that easy. Um, they also, it introduced this whole thing of social coding, right? Like, it's not just about, you know, you um, and your source code. It's when you're on GitHub, you're connected to a global community of developers. You have profiles, you have stars, you have contribution. Yeah, I, cups, you have I, think, I think that's actually sort of the, the, the key thing that's, it's almost, yeah. um, uh, so I remember Brooke and I actually started doing some work on GitLab and in fact, we enjoyed some of the permission features, the way that you can kind of stack projects on there and, and things like that. But ultimately, um, we made the decision to use GitHub because um, it was it was a social slash marketing decision uh, to be part of that, um, where we felt that like anything else would be too much of a uh, uh, would degrade uh, or create a barrier to entry basically for certain types of people. So I think that's been really interesting. One, one other question, while I'm interrupting, I think something yeah. that would be really interesting is um, uh, some years around some of these things. Like I'm, I'm like Googling in the background, like, oh yeah, what year was that? What year was that? Um, yeah. In a really interesting way, because um, I was part of the Drupal open source community starting mm -hmm. around 2003. And I remember the transition from CBS to uh, SVN as an example. Um, mm -hmm. And um, so just, and even like, I don't, what, um, 
do you know when GitHub was founded? I, I don't know offhand. I think it was, so I think it was 2008, but it might have been a little bit earlier. Um, but I think that 2008 was at least a year that it was like founded. 2008, yeah. I just, yeah. I just looked it up. And I think the number, so August 2019, 40 million users. Yeah, uh, is the is the number there on uh, on Wikipedia? Yeah, I okay, I, I, I think I have a number slide here. Yeah, there, there we go. go. Okay, yeah, <laughs> cool. But okay, yeah, I think Sorry. that no, but the the timing of GitHub is also really important because in two thousand eight, that's also when Facebook and Twitter and all these like other big social platforms, because people were discovering the idea of a platform, and like at the end of the day, GitHub is like a code collaboration platform, but it is also a social platform, and that's why it's been able to maintain such, um, you know, a, a hold in the developer community because it's building a great product for developers and also helping developers connect with each other. So it's huge. Um, but then, yeah, the last one is enhanced workflows, right? You have PRs now, and now you see with Microsoft acquisition, GitHub Actions, GitHub Registry, you start seeing the entire offering being enhanced and built through being strengthened by the community of developers, but also, you know, because they're building just, you know, they keep building a product that's just offering what developers need. They're just solving developers problems. Um, and so, yeah, the numbers, I mean, there's 40 million developers on GitHub over 41 countries. Um, there's like over 44 million repositories created this year. I mean, it's a huge, huge global platform and it's also huge for open source, right? So like GitHub has done so much for how the open source, um, how the open source ecosystem has grown outside of what the original like free and open source ecosystems were um, when the concepts and the ideologies were starting to be presented. Um, you know, like 1.3 million first time contributors joined GitHub this past year, which was in 2019 and made their first contribution. Um, and over 350,000 GitHub users made over 5 million contributions to the top 1,000 projects. So like GitHub is the largest repository of open source software, um, which is huge. And, and it's because of all the features that I just laid out, but it is where most open source communities um, have their base. Of course, some are outlying, but you know, it's generally. So the thing about GitHub is that it's kind of I mean, the whole thing is it's built on Git, right? Like GitHub really, when it was founded, um, really staked um, their, their bets on uh, Git being the distributed version control. And you could say that the pairing is kind of what led to both of them becoming so prominent um, in uh, global development communities. Um, but again, I think a lot, I have um, non-developers who I uh, speak with uh, are like, well, what's the difference between GitHub and Git? You know, you if GitHub is centralized, like you have, you know, Git. But GitHub is basically, you know, um, I would say it's nothing without Git because it's, you know, but it's now starting to become so much more than just Git um, because its non-Git features have completely overtaken the developer experience. Again, for good reason, like they're solving uh, problems. But these uh, non-Git features are also native, closed source, and controlled um, by GitHub. Um, and so you start seeing now with introduction of actions and these enhanced workflows, um, you're seeing that that's, that's a play, right? Because they're, they're increasing their product offering um, and they're trying to keep developers' attention um, by giving them the best experience. Um, but now we start to see the separation between Git, the open protocol, and GitHub, the closed platform, only start to increase. Um, and so We've seen GitHub become a closed garden that's built on open soil, which is like very similar to a lot of the other platforms um, that were uh, coming uh, to uh, prominence around the founding of GitHub as well, right? You, we have closed um, companies building on open protocols. Um, whatever you say about that, <laughs> you know, whatever you feel about that. For me, I look at that and I see that now Microsoft owns um, the platform that hosts the largest repository of open source software in the world. Um, and it's, it's a big deal because regardless of, um, you know, the, the values that you hold, um, there is a lot to be said with one uh, corporation uh, based in one uh, nation state um, being able to control, um, you know, an entire platform. Um, and so I'm not saying this is good or bad. What I'm saying is that this is just, you know, the state of the world and the state of, uh, you know, GitHub as it stands. Um, uh, and so because, Caleb has a question that's just probably relevant right yeah. now. So why do you yeah. think Microsoft acquired GitHub 
because Azure DevOps has a better ecosystem for builds and stuff, or maybe to steal the user experience for Azure repos? I think that it's to consolidate the user experience because I think that they saw the opportunity of where CI was going and with GitHub Actions. Um, like the, the launch of GitHub Actions, I think is directly correlated to the Microsoft acquisition is that Microsoft wanted to come in because they realized what developers needed and they needed a, another part of this development stack. And they saw that what they had with Azure, Azure, I forget how you say it. I never pronounce it correctly. Um, that they could come Azure in and Azure, could, pretty close. Yeah, exactly. Um, that they could come in and they could really snag something unique in what they're building into, um, uh, the GitHub Actions workflow. Um, so I think it is to consolidate the user experiences um, and also maybe to capture this opportunity that they were seeing by how large this platform was. Um, and I also think it made sense for Microsoft just because Microsoft is for the developer and is always looking to you know, build tooling for the developer. And GitHub is one of the main tools for the developer right now, in my opinion. Caleb, does that answer your question? Sure, sure. Thanks. Yeah, I think um, I think it's really interesting to uh, see a sort of battle for developers and where Microsoft, um, in many ways, went back to their roots. You know, they've always actually, as of all of their software, they've always built really great developer tooling, whether open source or closed source. And yeah. I think they actually are the single largest contributor to the Linux kernel right now. Um, right. So it's, it's this weird mixed feeling because again, back in the early two thousands, um, they were the big enemy. Um, yeah. um, and it's very interesting seeing them pick up LinkedIn, uh, mm -hmm. GitHub. Um, I don't know that the rumor purchase of TikTok makes any sense whatsoever. <laughs> What do you think, Abby? Do you want to do some I, developer TikTok? Uh, oh my gosh, I'd <laughs> rather never get into that conversation. <laughs> well, but it is interesting, right? Because it is, it is, it's such a, like the brand of Microsoft. Like, I don't think Microsoft is inherently evil. And I think a lot of people think that that must be my opinion because I'm working on Radical. But it, it's more just interesting into how developer attention and experience has evolved throughout these platforms and how the people building the tools for the developers are trying to keep up, um, which I actually think speaks to the power of the developer community and how, um, and the power of, I think, free and open source as an ideology has maintained and, and held its ground um, in, against, you know, other uh, means of like corporate capture and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, we can, this can be part of the discussion at the end. I have tons of thoughts of this and like would love to dive more into our sure. on this. I've also talked to a lot of people like GitHub about this who worked at Microsoft and or who worked in like only free and open source communities. So there's tons of interesting stuff there. Yeah. Um, but the point of the slide is that at the end of the day, it Microsoft now does own GitHub. Um, and so the pro this is now kind of getting into the problem of radical, right? Like the problem of radical we don't want to decentralize everything. We just believe that there are real issues with hosted platforms. Um, we think that there's platform risk. Um, you know, GitHub can terminate uh, any account at any time. They can ban entire countries um, based off of US trade sanction laws. They can change their terms of service. Um, they can discriminate on user behavior. Um, you know, people are also like really locked into GitHub, right? Like non-Git native social, social artifacts like issues, comments, reviews are entirely hosted on GitHub. Um, there's not a really easy way to port that data off of GitHub. So if you got locked out, yeah, you would have your code, you'd have everything that's version controlled, but you'd lose, I, in my opinion, the collaboration and code collaboration. Uh, and you also have this social network that's like locked in. This is the reason why you chose GitHub, right? Because it has such a strong um, social community. Um, and you also have all these additional feature sets that are making it really hard to go anywhere else. So GitHub Actions, um, some of the other stuff that GitHub's starting to roll out, GitHub sponsors too. Um, they're creating a larger offering um, because they want to keep people paying. They want to keep people involved. Um, and so they're kind of creating this like vendor lock-in. And then the final one is that there's security risk. Um, you know, actually it's interesting that this Twitter hack happened um, and I posted a tweet 
Um, Cause it was like, it can happen to Twitter. Like, don't we think it can happen to GitHub? And I think that, uh, you know, uh, hacking a Twitter account to post a Bitcoin address is one thing. Um, but if a GitHub employee or a hacker could compromise GitHub, you could compromise the security of a project in so many ways. I mean, you can access private repos. Um, you can introduce commits into the source code um, that appear to be signed by maintainers, but they're not. Like you can basically like manipulate the user interface of GitHub and like really introduce um, all these like tons of tiny little attack vectors um, that are serious um, security uh, risks for larger uh, projects. Um, and I think that a lot of um, like Bitcoin Core, for example, has started trying to sign their reviews and like try to introduce more security into the non-Git native artifacts so they can start mitigating this security risk. Um, and so there's a lot more examples here that we can dive into, but I also wanna make sure that we're staying on time. Um, but so ultimately me and, and, and the radical team uh, really believe that our dependence on centrally hosted platforms and corporations for the distribution of critical open source infrastructure is inherently unsustainable. Um, and this is, this is a, an opinion and, and a belief that we stand by. Um, and this is kind of the base for why we're building Radical. Um, and this gets into what Radical is, right? So uh, we see peer-to-peer -peer kind of being a new hope. And this is a nice little Star Wars reference. Um, you know, we think that peer-to-peer -peer is kind of the technology and the, and the emergence and advancements in cryptography and peer-to-peer -peer networking has the ability to kind of uh, put the centralized platform empire on its head um, and, and, and start revisiting like the initial um, values that um, drove code collaboration in the protocol development of distributed version control. Um, and so we believe that peer-to-peer -peer co code collaboration can, we believe that code collaboration in general can be uh, done without intermediaries. We don't think that intermediaries are necessary. Um, and that's kind of what peer-to-peer -peer, uh, is enabling us in the Radical Solution is that we believe that we can build really great, rich user experiences around code collaboration that are built on open protocols and not on closed source um, platforms. Um, and so why Peter Peer? Sometimes the answer is obvious, um, but I love this slide that one of our founders created. Um, peer to peer networks are just economically resilient, politically resilient, and technically resilient. So like peer to peer systems don't need to make a profit to subside, right? Um, the bur burden is distributed evenly across the entire network. They're also not subject to the will of authorities. They can't be captured um, and they're extremely hard to attack and take down. There is no single point of failure. Um, and this resilience is something that is like so on board with the free and open source community and also this emergent Web3 uh, communities. Like free and open source software and Web3 software need resilient infrastructure because of the ideological values behind them and also because of the software that they're building. Web3 is now building software that has millions and millions and millions of dollars flowing through it. Um, and we are starting to see code not only be like the Lego block that's keeping up the entire structure of our <laughs> world, but also like becoming even more apparent and more a blatant of a need um, for developers who are in these emergent and um, sustained industries. Um, yes, any questions there? I thought I saw someone speak. No. Good. Okay, cool. Um, also, the peer to peer ecosystem is growing. I mean, more than ever, peer to peer is on the tip of everybody's tongue. We have all these like super rich, resilient communities who are building peer to peer tech and are building everything open source, um, which is something that I think is really unique about where we are um, right now is that everything is open source. And that is how these emerging communities are flourishing and developing because everybody's building off of each other's code. Um, and so that's a really good place to start. Yes. Yeah, I just, uh, uh, I looked at it a year ago or more, but Scuttlebutt, I think the first thing they did, they did, did their own Git gets, gets server. Mm -hmm. Git SSP. I don't, yeah, so I just don't know whether you're aware of that. I mean, that was the first thing they did. Yeah, we uh, work with, um, we have, we've been chatting with some of the people who have been building Git SSP because it's, you'll see in the radical architecture, the SSB approach is super similar to the radical approach. Um, and so I, we were talking with them and there was a lot of inspiration and a lot of conversations okay. with That's the fine. team at that time. Yeah, no, it's, I just, but it's I, I just cool, want, right? So I just wanted to support the point that, that uh, yeah. since I think they are the furthest out in the, in the, in the new protocol space, as far as I'm concerned, uh, they, they, they really mm -hmm. talking about it could even work if you don't have internet. So, 
Yeah, uh, it can survive so, the zombie so, apocalypse. Yes, yes, yes. So, so that really mean that that the first thing they, 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 that was obvious from that uh, perspective that you you know you can't do this on GitHub or anything yeah. else. Yeah, exactly. So, right. And yeah. that's what's so cool, right? Is that you see SSB as this protocol now developing this huge resilient community um, that is only growing. Like I remember learning about SSB like two years ago or something, and now seeing it where it is now. And what people are building off of it, many versions. Do you, do you yeah. know the figures? I think a year and a half ago, it was 10,000, the biggest that I've seen network. That's awesome. I, know, I, don't, I didn't know the numbers. I should check in with maybe like Andre or something. I've been chatting with Andre about many verse, um, trying to get some of his thoughts on Radical 2. But um, yeah, I think that the numbers are only growing because this stuff is becoming so important. Like people are really thinking about this and like really thinking about the problems that like peer-to-peer -peer technology solves. Um, and I think that that's really exciting. Also, DAT, DAT is so great. DAT has been doing so much stuff too. Um, I mean, the stuff that they've been doing in the browser as well has been like really, really exciting. So shout out to DAT. Um, so to bring it back to code collaboration, Git decentralized code collaboration from centralized version control, and then GitHub kind of re-centralized it. And with this lock-in and how they've approached, you know, code collaboration from the start of Git from 2008, you've now kind of seen this re-centralization just as you've seen with social platforms like Twitter and Facebook out today. Um, and so that's kind of the setting for Radical is that Radical is, was conceived kind of as an alter alternative to centralized code collaboration is that we believe that we can re-decentralize uh, code collaboration um, by building within this protocol first ethos that um, you know, inspired Git in the first place. Um, and we can do it free and we can do it free in open source um, and we can do it beautifully and we can build really great user experiences around Radical. Um, so the reason that Radical, Radical is um, basically like the first root of any plant, I think is the actual definition. Um, so we thought that that's, you know, it's tis the root. Radical is kind of the start of how we can um, envision uh, a world of peer-to-peer -peer code collaboration. Oops, this diagram doesn't show up. That's so annoying. Well, so this is the stack. You can kind of see it in the corner over here. Um, shit. Well, I'll just talk through it. Um, but basically, Radical is a sovereign stack for code collaboration. So um, at the bottom layer, we have a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, replication uh, layer um, that's very similar to SSB. Um, and it's uh, built on top of Git, though. So instead of, um, so basically, what we did was instead of, uh, we originally started building on IPFS. Um, and found that it led us to take out the best parts of Git, um, which are pack files um, and some of the awesome protocols that uh, make Git so great to collaborate on. Um, and so we kept Git and um, or your any other distributed version control, and we built a peer-to-peer -peer replication layer on top of it. Um, so basically replacing um, the networking of Git um, with a peer-to-peer -peer gossip protocol. On top of that, we have um, the registry, um, which is a consensus protocol, um, which I'll get into. Um, and on top of that, we have an application that we're building, um, which I'll actually demo today, which would be really fun. Um, but the whole point of this is that it's all open protocols. Um, so it's a, a stack that's open that anybody can use, that anybody can build, uh, you know, to design their own code collaboration experience. Um, so. I'll start with the peer-to-peer -peer protocols that basically what we've done is created a social overlay off of Git, um, on top of Git. So what this um, uh, protocol does, which is called Radical Link, is that it uh, gossips Git repos um, and, and Git remotes across networks of um, interested parties. So just like SSB um, allows you to uh, uh, replicate people's feeds based off, off of who you follow, Git repos are um, and remotes are uh, replicated um, via the remotes of the remotes and the remotes of the remotes. So if you are creating a working copy of someone's uh, repo, um, you're replicating theirs, they're replicating yours, and you're starting to create this like social um, uh, ripple effect of how many people are, are able to see and access uh, your code. Um, and so that's basically how we make data available on the network is again, by tracking via remotes and then remotes and remotes and then remotes and remotes and remotes. Um, and we do that all with Git repositories. Um, so what happens is that we have this um, local first, peer-to-peer -peer, and like super secure <laughs> means of code collaboration. Um, so because you're replicating everything off of um, your local machine, 
all of your issues, your revisions, um, even like your code reviews exist on your computer. And so everything's always available, even offline, similar to the SSD value proposition, right? You're always able to access everything. Um, it's also really secure um, because with Radical, you also have peer identities, um, which are based off of the device that you're using. Um, and so with public key cryptography, um, we actually sign everything. So not just commits are signed, you can actually, with Radical, you can sign any code collaboration artifact in the network. Um, and you can also own and control that data and how it's disseminated through the network, through self-moderation and how you're replicating your data. Um, and then finally, it's peer-to-peer, -peer, right? So there's no servers, there's no platforms, there's no in-betweens. Um, you can share your code uh, with anybody without relying on a third party to host it um, or allow you to do that. Um, and those are kind of like the three main value propositions of why this is, you know, so awesome. Um, and so <laughs> this is a, a diagram uh, of GitHub that I actually just found the other day, so I wanted to include it. You can think of GitHub as... Um, two uh, computers um, which are pushing and fetching code from a central server um, that also has that centralized you know, version of that repository. And that's the computer, beep boop. And you can think of Radical as this like really awesome magic peer-to-peer <laughs> -peer network where people are just sharing um, code fr from their machine to their other machine. Something that it survives the zombie apocalypse, something that you can do offline, a cabin in the woods or in your parents' basement. Like it's just giving you the ability to collaborate on code and not just mailing list collaboration, but like GitHub collaboration um, without re relying on a single company, a single server, um, or any intermediary. Um, and so to keep going through the stack is that what we're doing, which I think is a really important part of Radical, is that we're building a front-end client called Upstream. Um, and so Upstream is a desktop client for accessing the Radical network um, and publishing your code to Radical. Um, but it's also like a code collaboration app. Um, and what we're doing with Upstream is trying to like revisit like what makes code collaboration uh, great and like how can we make it better um, by designing a new experience. Like everything doesn't have to be, <laughs> you know, um, the way that GitHub does it. And so with Upstream, we're also revisiting how we can make developers' lives easier, how we can make it, uh, their work faster. Um, and more enriched. Um, and we're also making it really pretty. Like, you know, this is a, the whole point of code collaboration is to keep it easy. And so by going peer to peer, we don't want to make it harder. We want to make it easier for developers to collaborate um, and give people the ability to collaborate from wherever they are in the world um, uh, and whenever they want. Um, so I'll demo this because we actually have like a stable build that I can show you. It's not like linked up to the peer to peer stuff, um, but I can just show you the user experience. Um, which will be really fun. Um, so we're just wrapping up here, but I'll talk a little bit about um, the Radical Registry and kind of, this is more like future state. Oh, last thing on Upstream. This is the de facto way of using Radical, but anybody can build their own Upstream, just like anybody can build their own SSD front, uh, front end, right? Um, and I think this is really important because this is also breaking open the box of platforms. Like, yeah, we can build great user experiences, but this is connecting to an open network that anybody can connect to. Um, it's just giving you a gateway into that network. And we think that peer-to-peer -peer networks need really beautiful, enriched um, user interfaces to bring people in to those networks. And that's kind of you know, really why we're spending a lot of time building upstream um, alongside of the protocols. Um, so the radical registry is something that um, is relevant to my recent post in the vision discourse, um, which is how we're looking at the bigger picture of radical. So outside of peer to peer code collaboration, there's a lot that we can be um, supporting open source communities with, um, with certain emergent uh, uh, technology that we're experimenting with right now. So on top of the peer to peer layer, we're building the radical registry, which is going to be an opt in consensus protocol that's connected to, but again, like they're separate, um, but they're connected. Um, that gives uh, users the ability to connect in a peer to peer way, yes, with radical link, but also on a global scale. So the importance of the big part of GitHub is that it created network effects, right? The social coding, the communities, and also having like a global source of truth for like who developers are and what their identities are. Um, and so what we are doing with the Radical Registry is trying to recreate those network effects in our own way um, by uh, building um, 
a, a global registry of uh, projects and of users. Um, and we can have this like global sense of identity, the seamlessness that creates persistent and sovereign developer identities that exist out of platforms or user experiences. Um, and they're also completely controlled and owned by their, uh, the developer, their owner of the identity, um, which is like a really big important part of sovereign identity because you don't really control your GitHub account right now. It's an account on a platform. Um, but with uh, um, consensus protocols, you can kind of start touching on this like really cool concept that I can own this uh, global identity that is sovereign to me. Um, but you can also start experimenting with sovereignty in um, organizations and in collectives. Um, so when you have cryptography um, baked into the interactions in Radical, you can start really experimenting with trust in new ways. Um, so how can you uh, experiment with access control when you can trust the different people that you're involved in a project? Um, you know, we're building in new ways for organizations to kind of like take control of their admin, of their project management, um, because we're building everything on these like trustless foundations um, and these peer identities. And so like with organizations who maybe don't want their entire code base to be owned by one person or who want to decentralize the way that their um, assets are managed. Um, you know, Radical is coming in and providing this really awesome solution um, that's giving these trusted foundations for interacting as a collective, um, but tying it to code bases, um, which is another thing we can touch on. And then the final one is built-in value networks. So with um, the integration of a consensus protocol, you're able to access peer-to-peer -peer value exchange, which is huge and is becoming way more a part of the conversation in open source development than ever before, like with GitHub launching GitHub sponsors. I mean, you can imagine GitHub sponsors, except without relying on GitHub to letting you use GitHub sponsors. The concept and the notion of peer-to-peer -peer value exchange is hyper important in the, uh, we believe in the sustainability of the free and open source ecosystem moving forward. And we want to be able to give open source maintainers and developers the means for monetizing and sustaining their work on their own terms, uh, you know, not having to rely on any platform or any intermediary, intermediary for that. And so what we're doing is that we're actually experimenting with feature sets. Um, and these are all designs. They're not really built into the app yet, um, but they're really exciting um, that give people who use Radical also the ability to touch on some of these awesome, you know, value exchange that we can see um, when you're working with blockchains. Um, and so this can go from giving um, maintainers the ability to add features um, that their supporters get, just like Patreon does, um, or sometimes GitHub sponsors does. Um, you can add uh, different community interactions, ways of gathering community signal, like um, allowing issue voting, um, or uh, backing of issues. Maybe um, maintainers uh, will, uh, you know, co community members will contribute money to get certain issues completed or fulfilled, um, and that money will go to the maintainer's wallet. Um, like, there's a ton of different, uh, beyond this, we've just <laughs> created so many different prototypes um, for how, you know, maintainers can really take control of, like, how their, um, not only of their distribution, um, but also of their production, right? Um, and I think that that's a really cool concept that uh, gives us a new design space to approach open source sustainability in Web3 and is something that the Radical Registry and the introduction of that protocol down the line um, will give us, you know, really awesome um, tools to experiment with um, and for other developers to experiment with. Um, so to wrap up, uh, we are launching our first beta. Um, uh, pretty soon. <laughs> uh, we're saying September and we're hoping that we can stay to that. Um, this public beta will be our, we lost an alpha about a year and a half, maybe two years ago. Um, and this will be kind of the first uh, launch of the stable protocol, um, the front end client, um, and will be, you know, the first time that we can start getting people uh, actually on the Radical network. Um, and from there, we'll keep doing releases that introduce more code collaboration um, uh, features along the line. Um, it's really exciting, um, and I think that's why I'm really excited to chat with you guys uh, about this today, because I'm, I'm excited for people to start trying this and start using it, um, so we can collectively start building towards peer-to-peer um, -to -peer code collaboration, because I think Radical is just a start. Um, I, we're really excited to build, um, you know, an open source peer-to-peer uh, uh, -peer alternative 
for code collaboration to start breaking open the paradigm of like what code collaboration and software development is. So I think our whole goal is just building, helping developers uh, build better software together, which is the GitHub line, but doing it free and open source <laughs> and peer to peer. Um, so that's my little spiel on Radical. Um, everything that we do is public by default, so not just our code, but all of our work. So you can actually check in on our discourse, which is radical.community. Um, where we have most of our development conversations and discussions. Um, Radical.xyz is our website. It has a bunch of resources on there too. Um, and if you ever have any more questions, um, you know, feel free to DM me on Twitter or um, reach out to me on Telegram. Cool. Thanks for listening. I hope it was slightly interesting. <laughs> no, that's great. It's uh, super great, Abby. Um, cool. Yeah, a uh, question around your, uh, you say sovereign and identity layer. I'm going to, I'm going to ask about some, um, some protocol level and, and technical details. Let's do so, it. Um, I'll try to keep up. Fission is building um, our auth systems on top of DIDs mm -hmm. and keys. Um, mm -hmm. Is that the plan for that global registry to use things that are DID compatible? Yeah. I think that that is definitely the plan. Um, I have to like touch base. So we recently made an update on the radical registry is that we recently made the decision to bootstrap features on Ethereum first. Um, so some of the wallets and the value exchange is like, we want to experiment with existing technology while we really secure like the peer to peer code collaboration side um, and build identities through there. So we've been talking a lot with um, like Freebox and stuff about their identity solutions. And I think we're doing it very similar to Freebox. Um, and I think that it's on top of DIDs, but I'm also not the person working on the identity stuff. No, no worries, um, no worries. Yeah, but there's yeah. a whole identity thread in radical.community. Yeah, um, Ident identity is one of those quotation marks in that we're trying very hard to not really to not do the social layer basically, yeah. um, because that's a whole other direction. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, but uh, uh, you know, DIDs are still emerging. So uh, I'll just say like, that's the exact sort of thing that we'd love to figure out some interop. Um, so we've got, 100%. we've got, um, I don't think I've said this anywhere publicly, but we've got internal stats um, that I that I look at quite regularly. So we just passed um, 300 apps uh, published on the Fission uh, platform. Um, so awesome. those aren't necessarily um, unique in the sense that um, you know someone will publish one and then I'll bring the code down and publish one as well with my changes, kind of like per branch, possibly mm -hmm. even just to to test stuff out. Um, um, but that's the exact sort of thing where we will have um, the, the core uh, atomic unit around the Fission platform is in fact going to be apps. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and um, we're going to work on things like uh, app remixing. So not really a fork because we're trying to be a kind of a layer above yeah. it in some ways, although you can think of it that way. Um, and um, so see, you know, very inspiring. Um, you yeah. know, I think our design space and our goal is we made the decision to uh, make everything work in a browser without any browser plugins. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. hence, hence no Ethereum. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's probably some other stuff around. Uh, Brooke has a design in her head. She's like, I think we can build a layer two platform using just IPFS and the um, uh, off layers that we have because you've got Merkleization, meaning mm -hmm, that you mm -hmm. can then, so I, th I see a really exciting area where, where the Fission stack could help power um, a completely web-based um, upstream client. Yeah, yeah, nice. Right? So what, anyway, that, that's just a bunch of background. Uh, another question for you around upstream. Uh, you said a desktop client. Uh, yeah. what, is it, what is it built on? Uh, it's built on Electron um, and it's built on Rust. <laughs> okay. Did I answer that correctly? It, yeah, 
Um, no, well, that's great. It, it means that it means that there's a path to just uh, having it run in browsers too. Yes. Yes. Um, and I think that that's ultimately something that we're definitely going to have to do. I mean, like, so the start is to get the peer to peer networking working. Right. Um, but then the next step is then how do you introduce this as a layer in someone's current developer flow. You can't just expect people to switch like right off the bat, right? And so I think that the path to browser is gonna be really interesting as we start experimenting with, you know, also what can you do in the browser? I mean, because what you can do on the desktop Everything. is that every, and that's what I'm saying, but with yes. the desktop it's interesting <laughs> because everything's local, right? Same. The issues with PRs Same. are local. Yes. I yes. can run local. <laughs> uh, so, I sorry, sorry I, I can't stop here. The point is that if you if you got Rust, if you run Dino or anything like that, uh, then anything that 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 you needed uh, needed you thought you need uh, need uh, desktop app is gone. Mm -hmm, if you mm -hmm. if you join, I mean, check out Tauri. We had it in mm -hmm. a previous one. I mean, Tauri is doing really nice. It's, it's okay. You have Rust, and at the same time, you you just you just use WebView. So you, yeah. you end up with not 56 megabytes of, the, of binary to distribute, but three. Yeah, yeah. And you also got consistency. So, it, anyways, uh, so, it's like yeah. we're all heading into a very similar design space. Uh, Ta Tauri, uh, as Giri mentions, is a, is a really interesting thing that they're focused on very um, secure and very small. Um, and uh, so they were on a previous one. and. Uh, and Ellie, Ellie is, is, oh, Ellie is in there is plus one again. Abby's like, sure, like whatever you like. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, so, I think that that's something that's totally on board. And I think that we should probably have Alexi, you know, who is, um, are you guys, I think you met Alexi? Yeah, Alexi yeah. was at the meetup that we did. Yeah. You know, he's has definitely more answers on our path to browser um, than I do, but 100%. Uh, so question from Caleb, um, one small thing I didn't understand, would I be able to use different version control tools with Radical like Darks? Yeah, so the plan, so not right now because everything's built on Git, but the plan is you being able to use distributed version control of your choice. Um, and what's really cool is that people can, you know, build their own implementations of that as well. So I think the point is that for it to be module, modular, to, for it to be interoperable um, and kind of work with whatever workflow, um, you know, developers have going on so but at the start get yeah um the, the and we have been speaking with visual yes which has, does everybody know visual visual is really cool i'm really we're really into visual <laughs> brooke did you did you have a question or comment uh nothing comes to mind uh you kind of covered the the one two points that i had presentation so yeah yeah i think i think um you know we 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 know that uh you and and your team um share a lot of the kind of opinions on uh even just functional programming and a bunch of other stuff like that you yeah. know um and, i mean they're um, literally called monadic so yeah yeah exactly <laughs> so you know i mean i think one of the things that we would like to offer up is um our focus has really been in part of how can we um, build a very new architecture, but um, understand how to tie into existing Web2 stacks. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things is, is Brooke has designed UCAN, um, mm -hmm. which is uh, essentially simply a, a decentralized version of OAuth that uses mm -hmm. private key infrastructure and DNS. Um, and so it, we, we're kind of this is a thing that we're saying like we needed this to solve a problem and um, we think it's a it's a strong pattern and if we can get more adoption around that that it what it does is if you assume ownership of identities then how do you plug in and do authentication in such a way in an OAuth world where everything assumes centralization and mm -hmm. you can um, essentially um, uh, uh, pictures a world that uses the existing sort of GWT token infrastructure that's widely used, but in a decentralized and peer-to-peer uh, -peer manner, right? Using public mm -hmm. key infrastructure. So again, it it itself sits on top of DIDs. Um, yeah. So it should be compatible. I think that's 
how to think about our collaboration at the end of the day, especially if you yeah. guys yeah. head more in an Ethereum direction. So a problem that we want to, will have is we also want to get developers paid. Yeah. But we're not going to roll our own token infrastructure or anything else like that. So that's the thing yeah. where it's like, great, how do we link a fission identity into what you are doing? Yeah. If you're in Southeast Asia or Africa and need that method. And for the Western world, what fission will likely run is something that's like Stripe because it works for yeah. those people, right? And then play with the, the balance between those two worlds. Yeah, and that's where I, I love that you mentioned that because that's really where the radical funding features that I just briefly showed are, are going, right? It's saying that we can harness this like really powerful technology of being able to exchange value across borders, direct peer-to-peer -peer through the interwebs, right? Um, and, and use that to, you know, really flow and create new value distribution schemes within open source communities, within open source projects, between open source projects, um, and do that in a really unique way. And we're really excited to, you know, start testing those features with communities um, to start seeing what works and what we can keep building and also give them the tools to build what they need, um, which I think is like also the most important thing. Um, yeah. And, and, I, so and I think... Uh, again, like, so we're going to kind of focus on the, um, right now you have to go to where the code is, which yeah. is very far away from mm -hmm. uh, the user experience, right? Um, let's take an app like uh, Upstream. That's an app that you use. Um, yeah. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's a desktop app. But if you're in the de de desktop app, um, or the, the, the user interface, can we actually embed and link um, features, upgrades, support mm -hmm. as far forward, as, as close to the user as possible, not close to the developer? Because again, the vast majority of people aren't going to be like, oh, I guess I'll just compile upstream from scratch in the same way that, mm -hmm. that, you know, open office being open source doesn't yeah. mean that end users mm -hmm. change a single line of code because no one can get the C++ make file working. <laughs> uh, but so can, can we, can we, can we uh, empower users? Yeah. Um, if we think about sustainability and we, we tie things directly to there, um, it, as close as possible to the application. I don't know what the answer to that is, but that's something that we're thinking about to making it very, very clear that yes, you can change this. Yes, you can be involved. Because again, even with 40 million developers on GitHub, that's mm -hmm. a small amount of humans yeah. out there. Yeah, 100%. And I, I think that the thinking is like very aligned with um, you know, what we're looking to explore. So I'm like really excited to continue those conversations, like as we start, like really testing those features, because there's a lot of testing to do. You know what I mean? Because I hate when people prescribe sustainability solutions to like, general groups of developers, because everything's different, and it's less about it's it's more about empowering. I think it's less about getting money directly in a system, and it's more about empowering developers and maintainers to figure out how to control their distribution and their production. And I think that like I want, I think that we can see upstream being and, and not just upstream, but also radical just in general as an ecosystem, as tooling for, you know, one developers to take control of their data and, and their code, but also of how that code is distributed and produced. Um, and so I'm, I'm excited to, you know, like really test that and like build those features for people, you know? I, th I think there's, I think there's some, some interesting things there around um, getting together behind certain UI, UX, and terminology in different ways, right? I'm, I'm less concerned about standards, although there's a, there's a piece of that in there as well. So um, for instance, I think that it is not unreasonable um, to look at a repo and kind of how do you signal or get a sense of what the fuck's the plan for this code sticking around? Mm -hmm. um, and a, and a tiny piece of this. So we, we've, we've got all these like conventions and things that have built up. So you might have a 
contributing.nd in all caps in the same yeah. way that you have a readme.nd and other stuff like that. Um, I think what is interesting that, that GitHub started is that funding.yaml Mm -hmm. I think is very interesting because you can put arbitrary links in there to the, mm -hmm. the GitHub interface won't do anything with it unless it adds support for it. But because that's at the Git layer, yeah. can we play both and subvert that mm -hmm. um, to try other things, right? Can we, can we start extending funding, funding.yaml? Um, mm -hmm. And so if there's a radical thing there and the fission platform ends up um, in its SDK supporting, you know, let's say it's a badge, uh, a radical yeah. badge, uh, you know, fund us on radical, um, sustain us on radical, whatever, whatever, the, whatever the thing is, right? Um, in the same way that, 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 uh, that fission might have some line items in there as well. I think that those are some really interesting things. So I'd, I'd love to, I'd love to think about more the like culture jamming social layer. I mean, I, I, yeah. I'm going to disagree with something that you said at the very beginning. Okay. And I, th and I think that, I think that, I think that we have to bring it up and we have to get radical again, by the way, I want that on a t-shirt. Okay. Uh, I'm gifting oh, that to you. It. you you'll, you'll have it. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, and uh, we're in the midst of launching our swag store. So as a speaker, you will, okay, you so will we can, absolutely we'll get trade, one. We'll trade, right? Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, so I think that um, we are in the midst of full corporate capture of open source. Full yeah. stop. That's a thing. Yes, that's I'm it. on video. <laughs> cool. um, I didn't know where everybody stood, so I was trying to put, And you know, it is used to train the AI. That's well, <laughs> I, I'm, you know, there's like galaxy brain, brain, brain version of a, of a bunch of this stuff as well. Um, I think that um, I, I literally just, I'll, I'll tweet it later. Um, um, I was just reading a, a tweet thread on, on this and there's a, a good article that, uh, that, that, that came up recently sort of really diving into open source versus free Libra um, mm -hmm. and a distinction there, which, goes back kind of 20 years and a lot of people, especially those who have, who have learned open source and code collaboration in the time of GitHub, don't even really identify with any, mm -hmm. anymore. Yeah. Um, and there's, there's not a strong understanding um, that open sourcing your code, well, let's put it, open sourcing your code used to be a radical act. Yeah, yeah. Now it is not if you pick fairly standard licenses mm -hmm. it used to be radical 20 years ago 30. um so do you have any thoughts on how like so for instance what is radical stuff licensed under what is it licensed under la isn't it i forget what it is i'm blanking on what it is and no worries, we can... Uh, it's, it's GPL v3. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's what I was going to say. That's yeah. what I was going to say, but I didn't know if I was going to say the v3 right or something. I don't know. Yeah, it's GPL v3. Um, and we're thinking... Go ahead. And we're thinking about exceptions, yeah. If we want to add exceptions, especially on the in some of the APIs and this type of stuff, for the obvious reasons, yeah. Uh, we can... Do you yeah. want to expand on for obvious reasons? Like, seriously, I'd... Meaning, yeah, so like when we're thinking about, you know, like adoption from uh, certain certain corporations, we expect that, you know, some folks like still see GPL and, you know, like they are like, oh, I'm not going to touch it, you know. And, you know, there are two strategies there. The one strategy is to say, hey, fuck you, basically, like, you know, we don't, we don't need you. The other one is basically to say, okay, if you want to have that, then potentially we can have some kind of linking exception. Um, yeah, with something that's more friendly to you, but we're still developing our strategy there. And yeah. I think there's a post coming on our discourse next week from, from the person that has been, has been leading all of that work. And I would love to hear your thoughts, by the way, boys, on that. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting a lot of people calling me, asking for what license they should pick. I was talking to Dan at MetaMask and he's like, Oh, did you have a conversation? Nice. Probably should have talked about this earlier. I'm like, yep. <laughs> um, so I think, I think, I think, 
I, I don't want to over-focus on license, but it's, it's like the, um, it's like the coloration on the back of poisonous animals. Um, I think that we should be thinking about a license not for comfort of corporations. Um, they are all so much more gigantic than us at the end of the day. Um, that, um, you know, one, one thing that was, was super interesting, um, um, Kyle Mitchell, who's done a ton of work in this space, mm -hmm. um, and he, uh, one of his things that I thought was really interesting talking about testing was to put a license file in your code, but basically say, call us. So it's like, it's like user testing, basically. If no one calls you, then they don't actually care, mm -hmm. uh, right? Um, I, I, don't, I, I think that's probably a little too simplistic to, to think about more, more, more broadly, but um, you know, we're thinking a lot about non-commercial licenses um, as, the, as the baseline. That's, that's very, very simple. You wanna use it um, you know, permissive in the sense that uh, as long as you're not using it for commercial purposes, you can use it out in the, uh, out in the open, um, keep thing in public, you can take it private, no worries. Just if, if you are going to make money with this um, and make money with it typically is included to mean using it in a worked context as a work tool, not like sell it or anything like that. So mm -hmm. non-commercial in a very broad sense, um, then, then you should um, pay to support this thing that you're using. Yeah, and I, to, to jump in really quickly, I, I think that's the big thing with, well, with, with big co's, right, is, you know, you put out some open source software, and then you hear a few years later that they're, like, rewriting their stock platform with it. It's like, but mm -hmm. none of that value comes back to the creators. Yeah. Dual licensing, um, I was unsure of at first, and I'm now, like, very much sort of like, oh, cool, like, you want to use this? totally like on your side project or something free or to contribute to the community. Amazing. You're going to make a ton of money off of this. Some of that has to flow back and I will happily sell you a license. Right. Mm -hmm. um, Kyle Mitchell, uh, who Boris mentioned uh, is definitely worth at minimum reading, if not talking to about this. He's a, a as, as we like to say, dual, dual class uh, lawyer and developer um, mm -hmm. and has like open source licensing is his thing. Uh, definitely mm -hmm. worth talking to you. Yeah, I'd love to chat with him more. I mean, I think that the concept of licensing is, of course, one, for like radical, but two, for like, how can you also build tooling into radical that maybe makes it easier for people to be empowered in their licensing? Um, and how can you introduce more well, trust some. into that process? What? Uh, Mitchell has some. Like, yeah, uh, okay, cool. He's working on, on a protocol for licensing. Yeah. <laughs> Sick. Yeah, uh, and, and Elliot and Abby, I can, I can make an introduction. He's yeah, yeah. he's that'd be great. He's not a huge fan of blockchains, uh, but if, as long as you stay on the P two P side, he's he's been a, a big friend of the um, the Hypercore slash App project. Um, nice. Um, so he's quite quite familiar with that. I think. Yeah. I, I think I think there's a I think the the collaborative space that's next. Um, so there's licensing and there's corporates and there's a, the current theory of how you walk tools into a broad developer base that somehow gets paid for at some enterprise layer. Um, I'm much more interested in thinking about how we engage directly with the users of software um, and empower them a little more directly. Um, mm -hmm. If you become... So Gary and I both use some software. Um, it 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 had a fee for using it. Uh, it's open source um, for for the for the hosted stuff. But both of us thought it was too low, so we're like, no, no, this is too low. We're going to go to your open collective and we're going to pay what we think you should be charging at a minimum. That is a weirdo thing for people to do <laughs> in 2020. So how do we how do we empower people to take a sense of ownership in a software platform? And that's the mm -hmm. part that I'm super interested in. And that that's some of the stuff you showcased with the screenshots, right? Like I'm putting up money to get this feature done. Like forget, you know, you know, and I think those are super I, I think there's a bunch of worries about like design by committee and a bunch of other things like that as well, of exactly how that stuff gets done. But the other half of this 
is instead of voting with like a like or like an impassioned post where you're like, here's some dollars that can help as a signal. Mm -hmm. but yeah, and this is the thing about it because like, so on one hand, like the, 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 I think the approach that we wanna take with the radical funding is that you don't have to over structure these things. Like you can, you can create like very simple ways of like, for example, the being able to pull behind an issue. Like you don't have to prescribe any solution. You just need to provide the tooling so people can use it, you know, in whatever format that they want. And then the second one is that like the, the idea of working with blockchain and working with crypto People like look at it and they're like, oh, wow, we don't want to be a part of crypto at all. But crypto can actually be implemented to make interactions like that way easier, to make micro tipping, to make pooling issues. Like this technology actually makes this type of interaction easier. And so like, how can we work through that? How can we create easy peer-to-peer -peer value exchange that's not over-prescribed or over-structured and just delivered to people to use and, and, and it empowers them to kind of create I, the experience. I think our big, um, I will dodge whether or not I agree with that or not and say, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, obviously there's things like transferring value across the world that like I literally can't send money to someone that I work with in Brazil right now because there's no yeah. path to it sort of thing like that. So, so there's a clear peer-to-peer -peer value transfer that's there. I think in 2020, you know, the decision that we've made is all of our stuff needs to work in all browsers, including mobile with no yeah. plugins. So that's our line in the sand. And mm -hmm. we're, so for us right now, we're like, cool. That means that we can't add blockchain solutions because yeah. they don't work in the browser. Of course, yeah. and we're getting insider here, layer two. Yeah. <laughs> Um, you know, how long is it okay for having that stuff? And we think that, that that's even more extreme and it, it fits with more a peer-to-peer -peer model where you can, um, there's probably something interesting to think about of the user interactions that aren't directly dollars, like putting dollars directly does a certain thing where, where if you have um, a, a set of radical points, mm -hmm. um, that might have a broader play space. And that's exactly the thing that ends up being, being interesting. And that's, that's what I mean. I'd, I'd love to figure out what, what some common patterns are and what the language we're going to use around it without diving yeah. into the tech, right? Like, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, even, uh, you know, blockchain or not, there's a, a question of how are you going to pull this out in a, uh, you know, more, more spendable way. Right. So, having this layer two solution and somebody wants to pull it out in ETH or forest mm -hmm. coin or whatever, you can put a bridge there. They want to pull it out in US dollars, you can put a bridge there, right? So like it's, it's you know, why not both, right? But yeah. starting with, and then you need to be running MetaMask or whatever the thing is, is a, is a high bar for a lot of people, even devs, yeah. right? Yeah. 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 Can I just pop in two things? One is that if you just type software is a conversation into this, into this search, you will find Adam Hyde. So if you think about all these value exchange, all everything that happens around software uh, or GitHub is just a conversation. So in a way, uh, so all, I, I think the, the really important thing is to make that lay there swappable, exchangeable. You, you, you may come up with a nice idea of how to talk about issues, whatever. And in fact, I, I, I look at it from the other end that, that uh, I don't know, I wanted to ask you about this. What do you make of the Git, the Git flow wars? What's your position on that? On I mean, the, the, Git, the Git flow, I mean, the GitLab was innovative when they said, well, you know, all this, uh, all, all this standard Git, Git, GitHub flow, it's great if you are building the kernel and you got thousands of collaborators, but when you are a small startup like we are, you you are you know you 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 will have a team of ten or forty, and under number number. So the whole point is that somebody has to review my code when I could have checked it into master, and that's called trunk development, trunk based development. As far as I can see, ninety percent of development, certainly in the open source world 
is really trunk-based development. So in fact, the Git flow that you have to, you, 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 you have a pull request is just uh, really, really mad. I think, and, I think and this ends up yeah. being again, blurring the lines between um, what does it mean to run a community project and what does it mean to use these tools yeah. inside a company that has 400 developers. And, yes, yes, yes. Um, but, and, and but I think really that's the danger as well of, the, of going down the, the path of, of, of optimizing things for, um, for company needs. Um, I think a lot of the things that are best practices um, that, are, are, that have speakers at conferences talking about um, Kubernetes, as an example, um, is is not the problem that a single developer trying to stand up an application for users exactly. has. Mm -hmm. So, like when you say Git flow wars, really the question is, how the fuck do we get better at code collaboration? It's like, yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, and you know what? I think that. Um, beyond the, like, on a general, on a general perspective, I believe that the answer to that is create more things that people can use to create their own workflows. I mean, I think that yeah, that's yeah, fair, I, I, uh, right? I, I, it's like, at I, the end I, of the day, it's like a more open protocol. Like, what was the last, like, protocol innovation in terms of code collaboration, like, since Git? I mean, there's been a bunch, you know, but in, hiding in the sides, but it's, completely dominated by this one protocol in this one platform. But, but, um, but and if, now, go ahead. But if you, if you got crypto, as probably Brooklyn thinks so too, then you don't need Git. And this, this is, is exactly is how I use, use Fission. I, I Fission up a stable mm -hmm. version. And indeed, it, it stays there because I want to have several versions going on at the same time. And that really mm -hmm. gives me a cryptographically verified state. And I even know the story of it. So you mm -hmm. see what I'm trying to say that if you've got the power of crypto in your hand, you can I, actually mm -hmm. mold it much more. You don't even need that protocol. I, I, think, this is the, I think this is the challenge is, is like there's this other piece here where, um, sure, even other ver distributed version control systems Sure, but in terms of serving people where they are right now, that's Git. And luckily, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. It, you must support Git because that's where they are come. What, I, what I'm just trying to say that 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 uh, in your in your thinking, you will you in your thinking of making the, the development experience in the virtual world, you can actually innovate. Obviously, you got to you got to be compatible with it. You got to play that game, and you can you should be able to make. Uh, the, the actual source code management system, if like exchangeable. In fact, you need to, I thought you said that, you want it modular so anything can be exchanged. So, so like, like I tweeted, the LogSec can come in and say, well, actually, if you would like to document your features or conversations in a sort of Rome-like uh, uh, network thinking, you, it should work with, 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 with what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that's what I, I thought it would be possible. And of course, because they work with Git, as it is, it will work. Yeah. Okay. This is, um, so we're deep in like um, IPLD land, where, which of course can, <laughs> can speak Ethereum and can speak Git and can speak um, uh, the IPFS Merkle tree. So that's some of the stuff that, that, uh, that we're, we're looking at at that, at that layer where all this stuff is compatible. Um, so question for you, is the, um, you're storing all of the stuff in Git. Mm -hmm. um, what is the, is it in, uh, is it in JSON? Like what, what is the format, um, the, the native format of Radical? Let me think, I, I, I think I can maybe answer that question. I think it has to do with pack files, right? Um, in that the reason that we didn't want to work on IPFS is because it kept us from storing. Oh yeah, don't worry about that. I'm not, I'm not worried about the versus IPFS, you okay. know, like. It, no, 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 it, no, but that's what I'm just referencing. That's like what, that's the kind of reference that I have is that 
is that we wanted to use pack files. And so we're using pack files now. And so I don't, I don't know the specifics to answer your question uh, in the most technical way um, of like what it actually is stored in, but it's like very much so using that smart synchronization protocol. Um, can, can, what, I think one of the things that would be super interesting would be, um, yeah, just the, the like uh, actual format of the, of the data layout. Do you, mm -hmm. uh, do you have that somewhere on, uh, in the docs? I'll, I'll check. Let me just do some, I don't know if Ellie knows. I think that that would be an Alexi question. Um, but let me, let me just do some, uh, let me go to finer code quickly. Here's um, just for everybody's reference too. Here's the, um, uh, the article on radical link, which is kind of like the protocol um just kind of like the overview of the protocol and how things are replicated in track and stuff like that um uh data model uh the doc must be serialized in canonical form, canonical JSON. Perfect. Question mark. Here's the identities. I can send this to you. I don't know, where are you? I think that may be the stuff that we're looking for. Um, but yeah, that's definitely a, I'd have to double check on that. Um, but it's something that also a ping in the discourse uh, would get the devs who were responsible for understanding that awesome uh i am gonna hit the uh stop recording button thank you cool. so much abby oh thank uh, you guys that was fun <laughs>